Andrea. I am so excited to have you here at Evidence Care's World Headquarters, as we call it. I want to introduce everyone to Andrea Ortman, who serves as Vice President of Inpatient Care Management and Post-Acute Care at Geisinger Hospitals. She leads the utilization management teams, as well as many other things. Uh, but you've been with Geisinger since 2011, mm -hmm. and you manage approximately 650,000 managed care lives, as well as 1,300 acute care hospital beds. And being over utilization review, that means you need to be ensuring that these patients are in the right patient status, and everything about utilization is in mm -hmm. order. So tell me a little bit about how you got to Geisinger and your career journey. Certainly. So I joined, as you said, Geisinger in 2011. Um, it was an easy decision for me to join Geisinger. Its services are essentially the area um, from which I, I originated. So my mm -hmm. entire family essentially receives care from Geisinger. And oh. so when I decided uh, to join uh, healthcare as an RN, it was an easy transition. They were in my backyard and I would be taking care of my community. Um, I worked at the bedside um, for several years um, and quickly learned that I really enjoyed the UR um, portion. You know, so when we were thinking about these patients that were in the bed and we're providing care and we know that they need somewhere else to go, you have to understand how that whole process works to be able to effectuate that move. Um, and then it's getting those patients to the right level of care. If you send them to a, a low quality provider, their outcomes are going to be poor. Again, easy for me because it was my whole family that we were taking care of. That's awesome. So that, that's how I was introduced um, to the healthcare system. And then, as you said, Geisinger isn't just a healthcare system. We're an integrated system. So we do have uh, managed care. Uh, and so my transition um, was from the bedside over to the health plan side. So you were a registered nurse. What type of RN were you? Because I'm also a registered nurse, so always curious. Started out with cardiac care. You learn everything in Yay. cardiac care. Did you end up in CCU? I was in the step-down unit. Cool. Mm -hmm. Did you have any idea what observation and inpatient was at that point in time? No idea. <laughs> and interestingly, no one talked about it on the floor, including the providers, had any idea what that meant um, for the patients. Exactly. So how did you leave the bedside and get into UR? Like, what interests you about it? Well, again, trying to understand, we knew that we had patients that required care on our floor and we couldn't figure out why we couldn't get them to the next level of care, whether it was home with home services or to a skilled nursing facility, et cetera. And so I just started learning more and more about what that meant and what were the barriers getting in their way. And I found it really interesting. There's a lot of logic and a lot of rules. Um, and I, I just, it seemed like a big puzzle to solve. And I it made it a difference. Too. It was a, it's, it really makes a difference for the patient. So the role of UR has really changed throughout the years. I remember early in healthcare, you didn't really hear a whole lot about utilization review. You knew that insurance companies were using utilization review to control costs, mm -hmm. but I never really heard about it in the hospitals. And then it's really caught on and it seems like you are is involved in a lot of things related to patients being in a bed and obtaining authorizations mm -hmm. and it's still not really well known but can you explain a little bit more about what you are is certainly it's all about patient status and payment right it's it's when it comes down to it it's payment but there is a direct impact to that patient it could be out of pocket costs but essentially your utilization review team, it's, it's a group of nurses and physicians that are using established criteria. It's almost always licensed um, criteria through in individual vendors. Um, it's also understanding criteria that's provided through contracts. Your payers, your Medicare Advantage plans, all of those groups apply medical policy. And it's the job of the UR team to help the clinical care team navigate through those policies um, and to make sure that the hospital essentially is getting paid for the services that they provide, which 
I think we all know is exceptionally important in this uh, day and age. Very much. To that point, I was listening to a webcast on utilization management and the UR staff, they were quoting that the UR staff is responsible for obtaining authorization for care mm -hmm. related to approximately $300 billion worth of commercial mm -hmm. plans, another $100 billion for Medicare Advantage, which means approximately $400 billion worth of health care is running through a UR program at a hospital. And UR programs are typically really, really small. So I'm just wondering, why isn't UR sexier and at the forefront of hospital leadership concerns or, you know, more money put into that program? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, um, Carol. And, and to, it's funny that, that you use the word sexier. I've actually used that exact <laughs> word um, with our CAO. This is, it isn't a, a process that people even know exists unless it's broken. Right. So if the dollars stop coming in or you're receiving patient complaints because the patients can't go to the next level of care, that's when people people talk about it. Exactly. Right. It's just in the background. And again, if it's functioning exceptionally well, maybe there's a little chatter about it, but it's almost always when it's functioning poorly. When you think about that, it's a big deal. The difference in payment between inpatient and observation is significant. It's significant. It can make or break the hospital, not to mention, again, the cost of care that's handed off to that patient. You're talking essentially 30 percent of all bill charges are going to be out of pocket for that patient. So I have another question around that. How can we get our clinical teams more interested in the UR process, specifically our physicians, because they are the ones who typically enter the status order and are documenting to support that level of care. But they, they don't know anything about how hospitals are paid. They only see how their bills going out for their services, but how can we get physicians more involved? Well, I think it starts with transparency. This is a big black box. The provider has no idea essentially what we're asking them to do. So when a UR uh, nurse is, you know, knocking on their door in days past or tiger texting them today saying, hey, could you put this in your note or could you adjust your order to reflect inpatient status? They have no idea what we're asking. It's actually we're quite pesky. Um, why are you bothering me again? What do you want me to do? And what we've found um, is that when you're sharing with providers the information, so think back to the days, right? And you are when you were using a guidebook, a book. right? <laughs> every it every show. <laughs> And, and it's all uh, dog tagged, right? Mm -hmm. You could actually physically show it to the provider, walk up and show it to the provider. Thankfully, those days are gone. But again, you, you need to help them to understand not only what's in the criteria, but what that payer is going to be looking for. Because to be quite honest, it's, it's a pain point for them, right? Mm -hmm. We're bothering them. The patient can't get what they need. They're you know, they have to know, but it's transparency. It's getting that information in front of them, not um, that they have to necessarily know it, you know, word for word, but letting them see what's there and what it means. And then I do think, you know, that it needs, it's an opportunity for education for all providers. There are a hundred percent of providers, no matter what their practice are going to deal with utilization review at some oh, point yes. in time. Oh yes. It's a big pain point to get authorizations because Everyone needs to remember that the insurance companies, although they have these covered lives and they provide coverage and payment for services, they want to reduce their costs as much as possible. So mm -hmm. one way to do that is through utilization review. Mm -hmm. So also, I think another thing that a lot of providers don't realize is the conflict or the battle, I want to say, between getting coverage and authorizations and payment for services performed at a hospital. It just is ridiculous to me, the amount of effort that hospitals have to put in to get paid for care that they have provided and good quality care, especially at Geisinger, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the patient always seems to get stuck in the middle. And if the authorization's not there, what kind of bill are they receiving? So what are you doing to make this 
conflict better? Well, there's a lot of things that we're doing in this space. And, and so, you know, when you think about utilization review, typically you're thinking about a fax machine. You know, you're sending these documents one by one. Um, and each of the payers has, while we share some criteria, the licensed criteria that we talked about, there's also those uh, medical benefit policies that we have to address. So it's under, you, you never know, even as a UR nurse, you never know what that individual reviewer at the payer is going to be looking for. And so it's piece by piece, you're trying to um, put this case together. You're building documents, you're sending faxes. And so what we started to do at Geisinger is, you know, payers have a right to this information. And so we're leveraging our electronic health system and saying, listen, payer, I'm going to give you uh, an automated notification that your patient is receiving services in our hospital. I'm going to tell you the order that we've placed and we've already do done the point of entry review, meaning there's been a dialogue between the UR reviewer and um, the providers. We mm -hmm. are confident that our status is appropriate. Yet. And we want you to come and query the chart. You look for the information um, that is most helpful to you. So you only let them into the record once you feel like the status is correct. Well, that status is correct within a very short period of right. time. We take great pride in that. It's approximately 30 minutes or less from the time of a decision to admit is, is instigated by the provider and the actual inpatient or observation order is placed. And that's where your UR team is critical. They must be right there helping to guide that provider because again, the provider doesn't know the rules. They're just trying to get this patient into the hospital bed and receiving the care that's prescribed. Exactly. So do you think the payers snoop around in your records? I do, <laughs> but they have a right to that information. Yeah. Uh, there are ways they're going that to get it one way or another. They're going to get it one way or another. You're going to send it piece by piece in a fax mm -hmm. and take days and days and lots of man hours to do it, or you're going to provide them access. And you better be sure that you're confident in the quality of care that you're providing, but we're confident in the quality of care we're providing. And if we're not, we better fix that, right? That provider or that payer, excuse me, should be looking in that record. Yeah. And again, it helps them. It's it's a limited um, use of the record. They're able to see the inpatient stay. They can't see anything that's outside of that inpatient stay. But again, they're going to get it piece by piece if they ask for it. Just let them use it. It's been exceptionally helpful in those payers that have leveraged it. When you think about it, it's not only a savings on the UR side, but it's a savings for the payer. They have someone ingesting faxes. They're required to keep those faxes on file for a period of time mm -hmm. for any audits that are um, completed uh, for that payer. So again, it just makes a lot of sense to just share it electronically. Okay. And we'll get a little bit more into your process here shortly, but are there any other ways that hospitals and payers can work more collaboratively? I believe there are. Um, ways that they can work more collaboratively. I'm not so sure that we're really talking in those ways today. So, you know, when you think about it, that payer is responsible for that life, right? There, mm -hmm. as you mentioned at the beginning of our mm -hmm. conversation, they need to make sure it's quality care that's provided and they need to reduce the medical expenses that are applied to that patient. Think about what they could do, a payer could do, if they're just leveraging that record and thinking about all of the anticipatory needs that a patient may have. It's piece by piece by piece you're putting that case together instead of planning for what the patient's going to need at, at, at the end of care. So there's opportunity there. Um, I also think, you know, we spend a lot of time worrying about cases that, in, from a UR perspective, are a sure thing. Right. This That's patient true. is inpatient and nonetheless, both the hospital and the payer are reviewing that case, you know, looking over and over and over again. It's a at lot the of details. manpower. It is. And when it's a sure thing and you're using the same criteria, which is the most comical thing, right? You're using the same tools and yet mm -hmm. you're arguing over that case. There is a way to do that. Another way. Um, is when you think about this, is with Medicare, all these value-based programs, right? It's a trust. It's a trust that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to do the right thing um, by that patient through that utilization review. So, you know, 
it can be done. You don't have to do that one-time authorization to reduce the cost. If you put some skin in the game for both the provider and the payer, this could be much more collaborative. We'll have to do another whole podcast on value-based <laughs> care. I got lots of questions <laughs> about that, but I won't, I won't get into that. But do you ever think inpatient observation status will go away? I don't. I think that we'll manage it differently. But when you think about controlling costs, it's the way to control costs. And I think there's going to be less and less patients that end up in observation in healthcare systems simply because there's a crunch on bed needs. I think we're experiencing that, you know, nationally. Um, and so only the sickest of the sick patients are going to get there. But I don't think that the actual statuses will go away. <laughs> Me being from Canada, they, they don't have statuses necessarily. They just pay per head in the hospital, um, per patient in a bed in the hospital, I should say. But OK, so I want to get into your process mm -hmm. and how are you using technology? There's a staffing shortage. Mm -hmm. um, how are you getting around that? Working with the payers, making your whole process better than it's ever been. What are you doing? So you mentioned about 1,300 beds at Geisinger. It's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so one of the things um, that we we are using in utilization management is essentially a patient uh, registration work queue. It's all about the logic, right? A patient is mm -hmm. in the bed, a review needs to be done. And so we're getting that work right front and center in front of the teams. You know, they're not querying um, patient lists to find their work. It's there for them. Um, and with that logic, you're able to dismiss cases. So for instance, if a patient is in inpatient status and you don't need to do another review, they fall away and that case isn't touched again unless some trigger down the road um, comes in. So again, using smart logic. So question about that, because for everyone's awareness, when a patient goes into a hospital bed, um, you have to notify the insurance company. So usually that's your registration staff doing that piece. The status order may or may not be in. It should be, but you never know. And then the UR team is then trying to obtain authorization. You get the initial authorization, but then there's usually a concurrent review mm -hmm. process. So are you saying because your payers have access to your records, you no longer have to do the concurrent piece? We don't have to do the concurrent piece. In most instances, this is where understanding your contracts is really important because a payer might, a reviewer might ask you for a concurrent review in five days, but you've already received the authorization and the approval for that payment. Now they have access to the record. I don't need to provide you with any additional information. Yeah. So it's, again, putting that That's work awesome. that must be done front and center. Don't don't make your staff try to find the work, bring the work to them, the valuable work that they need to do to them. And then it allows you uh, the ability to reconcile the work as well. So anyone that's worked in UR understands that if you miss one step, your entire case is essentially denied. And you've mm -hmm. got to work so much harder uh, to get that approved on the back end. So we just make sure the work is done. You mentioned about the notice of admission. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to uh, provide a provider or a payer, excuse me, with a notice of admission? Use technology. We have automated workers built that complete that notice of admission. The inpatient order is the trigger for that automated worker to notify that plan um, that the case requires review. Interesting. So how are you getting your orders in? What's your process there? Yeah, so it's interesting. The inpatient order, the original order, as I mentioned, is a dialogue with a provider at this time. But for those cases that require an upgrade and we're using that clinical uh, criteria that I mentioned, we have a nursing protocol in place. We've gained um, physician agreement. If the criteria is met, that, that nurse, that URRN, is placing that upgrade order. It's essentially a transfer order. Still requires cosign, but through that protocol, we're no longer requiring that a provider stop what they're doing 
enter the order at that minute um, to change that time stamp. Instead, we're doing it for them and then making sure that the order is signed before that patient departs. And it's been a huge time saver. Um, and actually, it's been quite the uh, physician uh Satisfier. Satisfier. <laughs> so how do you get around CMS's two midnight criteria or rules when they came out? They had mentioned back then, no, you are a case management protocol. So not that you have to get around it, but how are you staying compliant with that rule? Yeah, again, you, you can, you can absolutely do this. You must have your medical documentation um, in order. You must ensure that that uh, physician cosign is on the chart. So it's really still his decision. It's still his or decision. Her, his or her decision, because when they cosign, they're agreeing to that status. And they're documenting mm -hmm. to that status. They so. are. And within the protocol, it's really important. You have an opt-out function. So if that uh, provider, for whatever reason, they're receiving essentially a real-time notification, hey, by the way, your patient meets inpatient status, we're going to take care of that order for you unless we hear back from you in X amount of time. And so you're still, the physician still has the autonomy to do as the physician decides. But again, as we described, providers don't necessarily know what they need to do. They're just following your recommendations in most instances. So do you have UR staff in the emergency room? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, this has been uh, an evolving model. Um, so in Geisinger, as I mentioned, big uh, volume of beds, but some of the hospitals are pretty small. We uh, have a critical care, a uh, critical access hospital has mm -hmm. 26 beds. It doesn't make sense to staff that with a right. UR um, reviewer. And so in our uh, larger campuses, we do have staff in place uh, just to make that transition uh, easier for the provider when you're having that, that discussion. Um, but what I will tell you is that with use of the technologies, we don't have to do that anymore. We're pulling back more and more. And it was a feature that we had to consider simply because there's not enough nurses and it's really appealing for a UR nurse, especially third shift, um, to work from home versus sitting in that overcrowded ER. So oh, yeah. again, we're transitioning um, and that's with the help of the technologies, you know, we're super excited to be applying or implementing admission care. It's gonna help us along with this. So what are you doing with admission care? Because that's changing your process quite a bit. It is. It is. And so, it's very cutting edge, I have to say. <laughs> well, you know, we never do things uh, the same as everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing with um, admission care, like you said, it is a little different. I described the upgrade protocol that the nurses are using. We're going to apply the same principle uh, for the admission order. And specifically that financial status, inpatient observation and so the same thing that we do today, the UR nurse gets a trigger saying there is a patient that has a recommend to admit a status on their chart. A review needs to be done. The attending provider can start the admission uh, process, but that financial status component of the order will be completed by that UR nurse. Um, and it, it, again, all of this information, it's in admission care has made it possible to put it in that electronic medical record. All of that criteria is available mm -hmm. to the provider. So no longer will we have to worry about changing that order if it was just a provider ignoring um, that recommendation up front. You know, we mm -hmm. should be able to iron all of that out. But the other really important piece, we talked about it. Physicians don't know the criteria. Nobody in the organization knows the criteria. It was always kept in a separate place. With admission care, that criteria is now embedded in a physician progress note that is co-signed and, again, available to the payers that have EHR access. I always found it crazy that physicians never got to see the criteria or knew about it or really understood what is it that the payers are actually looking for. And I know physicians are clinically focused, but in this day and age, there's a fiscal responsibility mm -hmm. and hospitals are really struggling 
right now. I think we've all seen the headlines of margins being way down, but I love the collaboration that you guys are setting up and working with the doctors to make a better process. I think it's great. So do you feel like utilization review should report to uh, the financial side, like the CFO, mm -hmm. or do you feel it should go to the more clinical side, the CNO or a CMO? Well, this is a tricky question mm -hmm. because I report up a different way. <laughs> so, so it is a financial feature. It has clinical ramifications. So again, if a patient is in an in inpatient status, we have the option to use skilled nursing facilities where um, required, but plain and simple, you're working with payers, you're working with finances. It's a financial uh, component. I feel that way too. They do uh, work a lot with case management, especially on the discharge planning piece. But do you feel like you are in case management should be combined or are they two separate roles? Oh, definitely two separate roles. Uh, so there is a collaboration, as you yes. mentioned. Uh, they have to be aware of what the other one is doing. Um, and I think the way that you do that is again, all authorizations go through UR. If a patient needs an authorization to leave that hospital, that care manager needs it. Right? You need to be um, communicating back and forth. But the UR function is so different. It is that constant communication with the payers. It really isn't a clinical feature. You have to have clinical expertise um, mm -hmm. to be able to complete that review. But I think you need to be able to be free and clear to work with that payer um, and not be encumbered uh, by you know a patient uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. I say encumbered. It's just not their job. That's yeah. the job of the care yeah. manager. And I'm, I'm asking these questions because these are every hospital I go to or work at. It's a constant shifting of UR because it is not sexy, as we've talked about. So it goes from financial to nursing. It's kind of like a hot potato at times. And then they want the nursing roles to all be combined. One facility I was at, they wanted UR case management and CDI to be combined to one role and have one nurse do all of those functions, which obviously I fought against. Um, but anyway, I, I agree that you are in case management is very different and it behooves the hospital to have those roles separated out because of the billions of dollars that are running through utilization review and how important that role is. And it really should be at more the forefront for the hospital execs, in my opinion. So what are your top issues related to UR right now? Oh, it's all about staffing. How do you keep uh, nurses, you know, in the position and trained? And again, this isn't a one size fits all program. You it, just because you have an RN after your name doesn't mean you're the right person, you know, for that role. So finding those staff that really um, take an interest in policy because that's what you're fighting as policy mm -hmm. is it can be really challenging, you know, and the tools, uh, they need to be subject matter experts. So when you're thinking about applying guidelines, there are literally thousands and thousands of guidelines to choose from. And part of their role that we haven't talked about is being able to identify the right guideline for that patient, which essentially is going to determine the outcome of your payer review. Very much. So mm -hmm. I, I think staffing is absolutely um, the hardest part, which is also why I think you have to leverage technology any way and every way that you can. Anything that is a non-clinical task, get it off of their plate. Have them do the work that is really meaningful and find other ways to uh, you know, accomplish the tasks that are required. Again, that notice of admission, the notice of discharge, you don't need a human to do those things. It's all logic based. So I think that's, that's the key is, you know, manage the staffing through use of your technology. So related to the staffing and the processes behind the scenes, I'm sure you have a lot of reports that you look at to help make sure your processes are running smoothly and that your teams are doing what they need to do. So can you tell me a little bit about 
the types of reports you look at? Do you have certain KPIs that you use to evaluate your UR program? Oh, absolutely. And so when you think about um, your KPIs, you have leading and lagging indicators always. And so the UM team, well, first and foremost, I mentioned we're using those work cues. Mm -hmm. So there are daily reports where a work cue, you know, you're reconciling to ensure that 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 work is completed. So that's something that's it's day to day, but it's not giving you any real information. It's just task management. Um, but then we have uh, weekly and monthly reports that we look at that uh, trend over time. And it's really about those observation cases. The inpatients, we know the inpatient volume, it, it mirrors your total discharges, um, but it's that observation volume. What percentage of your patients are remaining in observation? And of those in observation, how many are crossing to midnights? And you need to pay very, very close attention to those cases that are crossing to midnights. That's where the nursing protocol comes into play. Either this patient, mm -hmm. you know, you have in some instances a social scenario that required the admission. Um, but if there is a medical reason, you better be working really hard um, to upgrade that case. Or if it's a delay in service, I'm mm -hmm. sure with your knowledge, especially on post-acute care discharges and getting that patient back out of the hospital, it's important to categorize all those. I don't know mm -hmm. if you categorize those and if there's a delay in like an MRI or CT that's causing your patient to stay an extra 12 hours, you know, that's very costly to a hospital. So, Absolutely. And that's, again, where the collaboration between care management and utilization management comes in. Mm -hmm. It's the care manager's uh, job to dog that case, make sure that things are being Good accomplished point. in a timely manner. But it's also the UM uh, nurse's job to make sure that they're monitoring on the flip side. And if it was an observation case and now the tests are coming in, you're upgrading as appropriate to get that patient out to the next level of care. So again, it's that, it's that total collaboration, but clearly defined roles. Do you look at short stays inpatient? Mm -hmm. Do you look at them before you bill the payer or after? Yeah, so it's a combination of both. So not only did we apply the work queue uh, technology to our URRNs, um, but our dedicated physician advisors use the work queue as well. That was, uh, let's just say it was a learning curve for them, but they're embracing it now, right? Why, would, why are we using a registration tool? Is your physician advisor team internal or do you hire an external service? They're internal okay. and they are dedicated positions. Uh, nice. we, so a few years back, we had essentially a handful plus uh, physician advisors that never really received any uh, formal training that were trying to uh, complete this role. We found that that is absolutely not effective. Uh, in the round robin assignment, when you're trying to fight a pair mm -hmm. uh, just will not work. Your peer-to-peer -peer is not instant. You need to, to have that scheduled. And so we have dedicated reviewers. They're assigned uh, to individual campuses and then have some cross coverage, uh, but they're expertly trained. Uh, they go through a training program. They've actually um, embraced their training program and are trying to train physicians outside of their team <laughs> about UR as well. That's great. So tell me a little bit about the training. Yeah, so they they get a touch of the criteria. They know what it is. Um, we spend a fair amount of time on the impacts to a patient. What does it mean if that patient is observation versus inpatient? We uh, teach them about the payers themselves and what are, you know, what are your appeal rights? So when our UR nurse is sending a case to a physician advisor, it's typically because we believe it's an it should be an upgrade, but the payer is disputing that upgrade. And so they they have a job to do. So we're teaching mm -hmm. them, you know, for instance, if it's payer X, you have to request this peer to peer in 24 hours. And by the way, this is the information that you should have at the ready um, when you speak with them. The nitty gritty details mm -hmm. of what a payer um has to offer us and what they're going to ask when we make that call. So they're they're really experts in this space. They only uh, have to manage a handful of cases. 
And when they get those cases in their queue, it's the expectation that they make every um, opportunity available to appeal that case. That's awesome. I, I think it's probably helped you a great deal with your denials and having those expert physicians on board. That's great. So related to that, you are related issues in the patient accounting realm. We're finding where the hospital has billed for the service. They've been paid for the service. And then six months, year later, three years later, someone decides to do an audit and they pull short stays, usually specific diagnoses or DRGs, and they want their money back. How are you handling well, that I, process? I will tell you the historic cases that uh, extend beyond uh, the, the current program where we have the physician advisors reviewing those short cases and entering additional documentation. It's still a bear. You're, you're querying the chart independently, trying to find information, you know, to support that stay, despite having already done that work for the payer. It's a, it's actually an, an, a nightmare. Um, and in many instances, you're not going to achieve approval for that payment. It's going to be a take back. But with the processes that we've established over the past few years, again, that physician advisor is looking at that short stay. They're adding documentation. We're now adding um, admission care, which has the criteria embedded in the medical record. These are all tools to help us to fight that fight around the short stays. It's just making sure that you have a concise bit of information that you can pull at any time to support your payment. Yeah, I think that's really important. Well, I don't have any further questions, but is there anything else that you want to add around what you guys are doing at Geisinger? You're a leading healthcare system. You're a brilliant lady. I'm so excited to have had you here, Andrea, and been able to interview you and pull some information out of you that hopefully other people will find useful and maybe apply at their facilities, which would be awesome. But if you do have anything else you want to? Again, I just can't uh, say it enough. Use your technology, find ways to use your technology and make sure that you're reporting your results uh, to your executive leadership team. You know, you are, again, you're not going to get any notice unless something is going horribly wrong or something is going exceptionally well. Make sure they understand. Put your data in front of them at routine intervals. You need to support your staff. You need to keep your staff. You need to keep uh, the investments coming into your areas. And that's That would be my only recommendation. Just make sure that your hospitals understand the importance of your team and keep it going. Yeah, toot your own horn. That's right. Completely agree. Well, Andrea, I want to thank you again for coming here to Adventist Care World Headquarters. We so appreciate you and we're looking forward to working with you soon. It's my pleasure.